Good afternoon and God bless all of you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I am so excited to be talking to you and conversing with you today on the word of the Lord. Thank you for joining me today at Midday Manor here at Cathedral of Faith Church. My name is Chris Martin and I have the wonderful and awesome privilege of serving as the pastor of Cathedral of Faith Church, Michigan's most exciting church experience. We are a body of believers made up of real people, real ministry, and real change. And certainly I want to thank God for all of you who are joining me today for Midday Bible Study. Before we get started, allow me now to go to a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for all things. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your outstretched hand, Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for your healing virtue. We thank you, Lord, for making a way for us when there was no way. And now, God, we plead the blood of Jesus. Lord, I pray, amen, for the blood of Jesus, Lord, to cover my family and to cover every family that's listening right now to this live broadcast. Lord, remember our first responders, God, our police and our fire. God, remember those who are on the front lines in the hospitals, God. Touch the nurses and the doctors and all of the nurses' assistants and physicians' assistants and those who work in pharmacies, dialysis techs. Lord, touch everybody in these hospitals, God, that are surrounded by this virus. God, I pray that it not come nigh their dwelling. God, I pray for divine protection and healing for those, God, who are assigned to the front lines. God, I pray for grocery store workers and those who are deemed essential, Lord, who have to go out every day, those in our court systems. God, I pray for the blood of Jesus, hallelujah, to cover them and to strengthen them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you bless them, Lord, that none of them be infected with this virus in the name of Jesus. And God, touch my brother, Lord, touch him, touch Pastor Chambers, God. Raise him up right now. God, I pray for the healing virtue of God ah, to touch his body. Jesus, you were wounded for his transgression. You were bruised for his iniquity. The chastisement of his peace was upon you by your stripes. He's healed. God, touch the Sheard family. Continue to bless Mother Sheard and bless my bishop. God, strengthen that entire family, Lord. Send healing and comfort, God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, I thank you for peace. Oh, God, I thank you for the anointing. Oh, God, I thank you because you're God. And look on those, God, who are fighting for their lives right now during this pandemic. I pray for healing and deliverance. Oh, God, I pray for every family, God, that's suffering loss. I pray for the Bush family and the Barnett family and all of these people, God, who are suffering loss, the Gatlin family. God, please send your anointing. God, we know that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And God, we lean and trust and depend on you right now to do it for us. God, we need you. God, we need you. Oh God, we need you like never before. We need you in our lives and in our families. God, we need you in our relationships, in our neighborhoods. God, we need you in our mind. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you for all things, God. We speak life. Oh God, we speak life over ourselves and over those who are on this broadcast. God, we speak life. Hallelujah. God, we speak life in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all again. What a joy and a privilege it is to be able to break down the word of the Lord with you today. Amen. And to inspire hope and encouragement to all of you who are watching this broadcast. I certainly encourage you, amen, to speak life over yourselves, over your children, over your grandchildren. I certainly encourage us all to pray hard, amen, and to pray without ceasing that God gives us the strength, amen, and the mental strength and the physical strength, amen, to come through this situation that he has allowed in the earth. Repentance, prayer, fervent charity for our brothers and sisters is what we need at this moment. And we thank the Lord for another day in the land of the living. Listen, we solicit your support. This church Amen. All of the leadership of this church, we humbly ask for your prayers. We humbly ask for your financial support as we continue to bring the gospel into the homes of many. There is much to be done. There are many people to be ministered to. There is much to get done for our neighborhoods. There is 
much outreach and connections that need to be made even in this pandemic the world is looking for the church to lend a helping hand and to lead the way in encouraging people that everything is going to be all right so i encourage you if you will to lend your financial support and those of you who are members you know exactly what to do but some of you watching are not members and we solicit your financial support as well you can bless this church financially with your tithe or your offering by way of Giveify. We are part of Giveify. You can type in the church's name and a picture of our church comes up. And also you can bless this church financially by way of Cash App. Our Cash App name is dollar sign COF Church. Again, the dollar sign COF Church. We certainly encourage you to support this ministry with your prayers and with your giving and with your volunteerism. God bless you. Remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power love and a sound mind let me turn your attention today to the book of ezra amen i'm talking about purpose today to the book of ezra the fourth chapter and i'm going to read verses four and five again that's ezra the fourth chapter and i'm going to read verses four and five and the bible says i want to give it to you again if you're just joining amen i'm going to be teaching today from the book of ezra the fourth chapter verses 4 and 5, and it says, Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them, verse 5 here, and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of cyrus king of persia even until the reign of darius king of persia i want to talk today from the subject never lose sight of your purpose again never lose sight of your purpose let me bring again attention to verse 5 that says and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And I want somebody to know that's watching this broadcast right now that the enemy is not laying people off, the enemy hiring folks. You ready to hear me talk to you? I said the enemy is not laying people off, amen. The enemy is hiring people to frustrate the purpose of many. And some of you listening to me right now, if you be honest, before we got where we are right now, before you began to deal with this pandemic, you were already dealing with a frustrated sense of purpose. Hello? I said you were already dealing with a frustrated sense of purpose. And usually that frustrated sense of purpose comes from a seed that is planted by somebody else. Now, you got to understand that many times out of the goodness of our heart and out of our obedience to God, anybody who has any lick of humility in them at all is not concerned about what your purpose looks like. You're more concerned about the end result of what you should be doing. Hear what I'm saying to you? You're not caught up with how you look while you serve. You're more caught up with the intent of your serving. And so many times when you are really focused on what God would have you to do, hear me closely now, there is someone whom the enemy will hire to frustrate the vision of what you're doing. Hello? Yeah. The enemy, Satan, will get in people and many times, watch this now, those people who he hire are not people outside the church. Satan hires people inside the church. Y'all better hear me talk. Because many times until you have receive Jesus Christ in your life, you don't know your purpose, no way. So it takes Jesus to reveal your purpose to you. And when he reveals your purpose to you, you're in his presence. Yeah. So when we come to church, we understand that we come to church to be in the presence of God. And so the enemy will infiltrate those people who should be enjoying the presence of God with you Instead, they have come into the presence of God 
to frustrate you, to get you out of the presence of God because you cannot function at total capacity in the presence of God without obedience. Listen to me closely. I said you cannot function at the total capacity of obedience in the presence of God if you are not in obedience. So what happens is, is that the enemy gets in the mind of someone who's with you and then they begin to plant seeds of discord. They begin to plant seeds of discouragement or they give you this word that ain't from God. Y'all better watch me closely here. You better be careful about neglecting your purpose in this hour. Many times, amen, we are discombobulated and we are inundated with the cares of this life. We are bogged down with the needs of people. Sometimes we are stressed out from our jobs. We are overloaded. We got all these issues going on. And in the middle of all of that, and I, and I know I'm talking to somebody out there, start giving me some hearts and some thumbs up. In the middle of life, purpose gets drowned. You know what I'm saying? I said in the middle of life, sometimes purpose gets drowned. Sometimes it's because you don't believe in your own ability. Sometimes it's because somebody gave you some bad advice. And sometimes it's literally because the enemy has saw your ability and your purpose and your assignment and has decided that he needs to throw you off your assignment. So let's look at this. It says, so now, the people of the land, verse 4, the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in the building. Ezra, who is a contemporary of Nehemiah, were all sent back to rebuild what had been destroyed. Jerusalem, the temple, all of that. When the people of the land saw the heathens of the land, the pagans of the land, when they saw that these servants of the Lord had been sent to build, they decided that it's better for them not to build. See, And so what they did was they began to cause confusion. The Bible says that they weakened the hands of the builders. Many times you're trying to build a marriage, you're trying to build a relationship, and you're surrounded by people who are weakening your hand. They're giving you bad advice. They're telling you, if I was you, I wouldn't do this. If I was you, I wouldn't do that. And I tell people all the time in this church, you need to tell people, first of all, you're not me. So since you're not me, I don't need to listen to what you would do if you were me because you don't understand what I'm in, so you're not me, so I'm not going to listen to what you're talking about. Y'all ain't saying nothing. You have got to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to you about what God has placed you in. Now, if you're in something on your own, then you got to depend on God to get you out of it. Yeah. But in this situation, God had commissioned them to rebuild. But the people decided, I'm going to frustrate you so you can't get this done. How many times have you sat in church and had an idea that you know came from the Lord and you let the folks around you in the sanctuary destroy what God had placed in you? How many times should you have already went to the pastor of the church and said, Pastor, God gave me this for the ministry. And asked the pastor to cultivate and to see as well what God was giving you. But many times we get thrown off by people who come and say, if I was you, I wouldn't even say nothing to him. I wouldn't even say nothing to him about that. I wouldn't even deal with that. If I was you, I wouldn't even, that, that ain't where well, you better make sure that's God. See, a lot of times people are jealous of your assignment. That's right. People have a tendency to be jealous of your assignment, and you have got to understand when you are talking to the wrong people. Now, many times when people see your ability, they get next to you. Come on. You'd be surprised how many folk in church are not your friend. 
They just next to you because of your ability. They want what they see in you. And if they cannot duplicate it for themselves, then they make it their business to destroy what God has placed in you. That's why you got to always be wise. You've got to understand what your purpose is, and you've got to understand what God has called you to do. And when you really get a clear indication of what God has called you to do, then your purpose cannot become lost in anything. Even right now, while we're suffering through this pandemic, it does not mean that your purpose is put on hold. No, it doesn't mean that. We should still be preaching the gospel. We should still be inviting people to join ministries. We should still be giving people hope. We should still be feeding the hungry. We should still be clothing the naked. We should still be connected. We should still have ideas of ministry. We should be trying to figure out how we can help our young people. We should still be trying to get young people saved. We should still, even through Facebook and Instagram and Zoom and social media platform, we should still be having revival on our mind. We should still be fasting and praying and seeking God for direction and purpose and assignment. What am I saying? I'm saying that there will always be people who have been hired by Satan to frustrate your assignment. But what I'm saying to the believer is, is that you've got to recognize who these people are and you've got to pray and fast for God to deliver you from the faults of these folks. Yeah, let me tell you something. Jesus could not get distracted from his assignment. Let's look at this. And the Bible says in verse 4, Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. So the Lord has 12 disciples. And uh, in those uh, 12 disciples, we know that the Lord's inner circle was Peter, James, and John. Those were the ones he trusted on the mount of transfiguration. Those were the ones who he kept the closest. Amen. Sometimes when he needed to steal away, he, he would steal away by himself. But sometimes he would take Peter, James, and John. We never see a man where he always counseled with all 12 of the disciples. Sometimes he had his inner circle, which was Peter, James, and John. And we see a man throughout the scripture that the disciples would always lose sight of the Lord's assignment to redeem man back unto his father. Now, of course, these are his disciples. These are the guys who are supposed to be around him. These are the ones who are supposed to be praying for him. And when we see testimonies of them, it is always something negative. It's always something discouraging. So Jesus prepares to feed the 5,000. And the first thing Thomas says and Judas they both get together and say, first of all, this is too many people to feed. And Judah says, where are we going to get the money from to feed them? In other words, they had not even grasped the fact that Jesus was 100% man and 100% God and that he had the ability to work a miracle and feed the 5,000. The first thing they began to deal with is the natural situation. This is too many folks, and Jesus, you're not getting ready to take all the money that we got to feed these folks. Jesus, being frustrated, just said, look, make the people sit down in companies of 50. He looks over and he gets the lunch of a young lad, which contains two fish, five loaves of bread. The Lord looks up into heaven. He gives thanks. He blesses the meal. They take up 12 fragments, 12 baskets, excuse me, of fragments, and nobody comes to him and say, we was wrong. Nobody comes to him and say, Oh, wow, Jesus, I, I, I should have believed from the get-go that you was able to do this. I should. It, it was always something that was frustrating to Jesus. Jesus begins to talk to the disciples, and he begins to foretell them in another story. He begins to tell them about the death that he must die to redeem man back to him. Peter lays hands on Jesus, grabs him. Starts talking about, no, nah, I'm not going to let you do this. They're not going to do it. Now, Jesus had just asked the disciples, whom do men say that I am? Amen. And then he asked the disciples, well, who do y'all say I am? They couldn't even answer him. 
Peter was the only one who said, well, thou out the Christ, this, you know, the son of the living God. Jesus says, okay, you blessed Peter. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. Okay. You keep studying. You keep reading. Peter then says that he's going to stop the Lord from fulfilling his assignment of going to the cross. Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. He says to Peter, you still don't understand my purpose and my assignment. They go to the upper room. He asked them in the upper room, they receive the Lord's, the last supper, and they sang a hymn, and they go out, and Jesus says, now is my time at hand. And he asked the disciples to watch with him, to pray with him, and they go to sleep on him. They don't even respect, they don't even come in contact, they don't even understand his purpose. They come to apprehend Jesus. The Bible says the disciples scatter. Three years they see his miracles. Three years they serve with the Lord. And soon as things get hard, they leave him. This would frustrate anybody. They leave him. Then Peter follows afar off. And just like Jesus says to him, he denies that he even know the Lord. Jesus, the Bible says, turns around and looks at him. And immediately the cock crows for the third time. He told Peter, before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. Before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he does just that. They leave him. They frustrate him. But even... Though they did not believe like they should. And when we get to the cross, we don't see any of the disciples at the cross but Peter. Excuse me, but John. We don't see any of the disciples at the cross but John. Satan enters into Judas. Judas betrays Jesus. It goes back to my earlier point. Look at verse 5. If you're looking at Ezra, chapter 4, verse 4, verse 5, it says, and they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. The Bible says Satan enters into Judas. Judas allows this. Judas betrays the Lord, brings the centurion soldiers where he is, kisses him, as a sign of betrayal. Listen to me, beloved. Satan will always come for those who are closest to you to frustrate your purpose. He don't care if they family. He'll use your mama. He'll use your daddy. He'll use your brother. He'll use your in-laws. He will use your church members. He will use your inner circle. He'll use your ride or die, your ace, or whatever you want to call them. He will use... He will hire the people closest to you to make you lose sight of your purpose. But thanks be unto God that Jesus never lost sight. He was 100% man and 100% God, but the Lord never lost sight of his purpose. I am come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. I have come to die to redeem man back unto my father. The Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not, but yet and still Jesus bear the cross alone. And what am I saying to you? Sometimes acknowledgement and fulfillment of purpose is lonely. I'm talking to somebody out there right now who understands exactly what I'm saying. Sometimes acknowledgement and to walk in your purpose is lonely because if people cannot stop you from your purpose, many times they will walk away from you. I said many times if people cannot stop you, if they cannot block your God-given purpose, they will walk away from you. If they cannot deceive you, if they cannot get you to lay your purpose down, if they cannot get you to forsake everything that God has said, if they cannot get you to disobey leadership, if they can't get you to go against everything you've been taught, sometimes they will leave you 
and they will forsake you and they will talk against you because the bottom line is jealousy is cruel as the grave and many times the people you want to love you will not love you. They were only with you because of your ability and potential but when you go to the place where they can no longer go, they will not cheer you on. They will not applaud you. They will try to frustrate you and you've got to know when they've been hired by Satan. And you can never lose sight of your purpose. You can never be so insecure. You can never feel so low on self-worth that you let the purpose that God has placed in your life go null and void. God has brought you this far for you to fulfill purpose. Some of you, your purpose is to preach the gospel. Some of you, your purpose is to be an ambassador and a missionary, not titles, the work, the work of saving, the work of preaching, the work of clothing the naked, the work of loving those who are bruised, the work of evangelizing. No, not with a title. No, not with a seat and all this stuff. No, I'm talking about just always having a ministry of helps, willing to put your arms around that young girl who's been raped or abused or molested, willing to be a father to the fatherless, amen, not for vain glory, not for your name to be called, not for your offering to be called. No, I just want to do the work. I have a purpose. There are people who are sitting in churches who are pure evangelists and you've not done it because you felt like God didn't call you because you got tattoos or because your past is so messed up. Let, let me tell you something. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. And it's time for us to not lose purpose. Now, I don't want to hear that hypocritical banter, amen, of people who don't live for God talking about I'm this and that and the other. No, you've got to live for God so that your purpose can be manifested. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things just became new. God has now positioned me for my purpose when I get rid of sin. And remember this. When we come to conclusions of decisions, God is not the author of confusion. If there's no peace in it, God is not in it. Yeah. The Bible says the way of a transgressor is hard. So what you've got to do is you've got to never lose sight of your purpose. Some of you, you're only on that job. You've been asking God for a new job. And God, I want to leave. You can't leave because your assignment is not complete. There are some folk on your job that you're supposed to have been preaching to and ministering to, and you haven't done it. And God's not going to release you. He's not going to let you get to the next level of pay. He's not going to let you get to the next level of management until you do what you were supposed to do on that particular position. Don't get frustrated on your job. Don't talk about, I hate it here. Stop posting, I hate it here. Why would you say that? God has given you breath in your body, a paycheck. You got life, help, and strength. Stop talking about you hate stuff. Don't say that. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Amen. You want to declare good things over your job. You want to declare good things over your ministry and over your purpose and over your family. Amen. Your first ministry is at home. You want to believe that you can build a family. You want to believe that you can keep your family together. You want to believe that your children will rise up, mama, and call you blessed. You want to believe, dad, that your children respect you and your decisions and how you've treated their mother. And even in of themselves, they want to believe, and it comes through the parents, that you want to inspire your children to be educated and to be well-rounded and to use good English. Amen. You've got to put purpose in your children. Come on here. You've got to put destiny in your children and you've got to show them that when the cares of life comes up, when financial hardship and relationships go bad and family walk away and church folk, I didn't say saints, I said church folk, begin to backbite scheme and hate. They've got to know how to persevere through the darkness and never lose sight of their purpose. I'm speaking to someone today who, if you would be honest with yourself, you lost sight of purpose because of what you was going through. You lost sight of purpose because of what you were in. You were in a bad marriage. You were in a bad relationship. You were in a man, bad relationship with folks in church because you got with the wrong crew. You thought they were safe. They turned out to be a bunch of Hayden, schematic folks and, and cliques. You found 
found out, amen, that I messed up and now you've lost your purpose because of all these things. And I'm here to tell you right now, some of you may be going through on your job. Even this pandemic may have you scared out of your mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power loving of a sound mind. What am I saying to you today? If you're watching me today, I'm saying to you, come back in contact with your purpose. And you get it in your mind. And you get it in your spirit. And you give God the praise. And you fast like never before. And you study your word and you pray and you lay out before God. Huh? Moshe. You ask him for the Holy Ghost. If you have the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongue, you ask for that to be stirred up in you. If you need the baptism in the Holy Ghost, you get in a quiet place in your home and you seek the baptism. But now is not the time to let the cares of this life and the fear of this world and the unrepentant heart of men stop you from what you need to do. This is the time to become re-engaged with your purpose and your assignment and you need to focus and plant your feet and get it done and get started on it and never walk away and never lose sight of what God has called you to do. You done tried it your way and your way has ended up in heartbreak and pain. You've tried to get folk to love you that refuse to love you. You've tried to marry and date people that God never had for you. You've tried to go from church to church to church because people ran you out of this one and people said you ought to leave and people frustrated you of it. Man, forget folks. When you are in a church where the Holy Ghost is falling and the anointing of the presence of God is, God has called you to that place to realize and to stabilize and to work in your purpose and your assignment. Never lose sight of your purpose and your assignment. And I think there's some people out there listening to me today that can get started on your purpose and your assignment. You're sitting there in your home and this is a God moment. It is a moment for you now to lift up your hands. There may be somebody who's even in tears right now because you realized that you have let too much time slip by and you've not been about the Lord's business there may be somebody listening to me right now whom the cares of this life the frustration of finance the frustration of relationship the frustration of self worth the lack of self esteem the pain of past mistakes and sometimes the weight of depression these things come in your life. But through it all of that, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Today, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm teaching to someone today who has lost sight of purpose, have lost sight and have quit and not been working on their God-given assignment. You were in the church. There were some who did run well. But you let somebody come in your life to distract you. Sometimes we went back to the bottle. Sometimes we go back to fornication, sex without marriage. We're looking for happiness. We're looking for completeness in all these places. And the Lord is saying to you today, you don't need to look to people to be complete. You don't even look to titles and positions to be complete. You don't need people to validate you to be complete. You need obedience to God and his word to be complete. So if you're receiving everything I'm saying in this God moment, I want to do two things. First of all, I want to get people back to assignment and purpose. You're in your home today. And if you would be honest and say, I slacked off my purpose and my assignment. But I'm going to pledge today to get back on it and not waver. Lift your hands to the Lord in your home and repeat after me. God, forgive me. Forgive me for being frustrated and confused. Forgive me for being distracted. Forgive me, Lord, for allowing seeds of others to be planted in me. 
into overshadow what you put in me. I pray now for renewed joy and strength and excitement regarding my purpose and my assignment. I pray for the power and the strength of the Holy Ghost to dwell in my life and for me to receive my purpose and my assignment and to go back to work and to start working. In Jesus name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, then you know that confession is very important. And on Facebook, Instagram, wherever you are, in real time, I want you to post right now. I want you to put in the comments right now. I am back on my assignment and with my purpose. I am back on my assignment and with my purpose. Now, you can't decree and declare that unless you are saved and you're living for the Lord. Saved people get distracted sometimes. Let's just be honest. We get distracted sometimes. But today you're, you're, you're decreeing and declaring. I'm back on my assignment and with my purpose. Now, there may be somebody listening to me right now who's not saved. You have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior. When times get hard, you still cuss. You may still lie. You still have sex with whoever you want to that you're not married with. You may have unforgiveness in your heart. You may have been molested. You may hate people because of it. You may have been abused verbally, physically. And there's hate and unforgiveness in your heart. You don't trust. You may be going through something or have been through something that has caused you to never want to be in church. I speak to you now. There's an assignment and a purpose for you. You may be saying, well, in my past life, I'm full of tats. And, I, and how am I going to minister now? God does not look on the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. And to you right now, I offer salvation. I offer salvation. I offer you Jesus Christ to come into your life. This is a God moment. Lift those hands. Whether there's tears coming down your eyes or whether you're just sorrowful right now, lift your hands to the Lord and repeat after me. God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for this day of life. I thank you for another chance. Repeat after me. I thank you for another chance to get it right. Lord, you said in your word that confession is unto salvation. And I confess right now that God raised Jesus from the dead and that he got up on the third day with all power in his hand. I believe in the power of God and Jesus and I believe in the Holy Ghost. And I pray right now to be saved. Jesus come into my life and deliver me from all my sin. Satan, I no longer belong to you, but I belong to Jesus Christ. For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things just became new. And right now, I am saved. If you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to know that angels are rejoicing in heaven. Your name has now been written in the Lamb Book of Life. You're a candidate for eternal life with Jesus Christ. And now you must seek the baptism in the Holy Ghost to have the power and the sustenance to witness and to stay saved in this sin-darkened world. And if you prayed that prayer with me and you received salvation right now, again, in real time, I want you to type in, I just received salvation not for show not for pride purposes but so Satan and every devil in hell can understand that you no longer belong to them but that you are now a child of God and you belong to Jesus Christ and salvation has come into your life I want you to put it right now on Facebook Instagram I want you to put it in real time 
Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for this prayer. We thank you for deliverance. We thank you for salvation and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. This is Pastor Chris Martin, pastor of Cathedral of Faith Church. I invite you to join me again this evening at 6.30 for evening Bible study. Please remember, we need your support. You can support us financially on Giveify, put in the name Cathedral of Faith Church, or you can support us by way of Cash App. My Cash App name is dollar sign C-O-F Church. God bless you.